So the que- the question uh, today, I think, is is there going to be any change in the focus on critical materials uh, in the by the new U.S. Uh, president uh, Joe Biden and his administration? And 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 the answer is no. It's the the critical materials interest by the U.S. Uh, federal government is increasing by the day. And I think that what people don't have is perspective. This interest in critical materials began in 2007 with the publication of a list by the U.S. Department of Energy of the most critical metals, the ones they were concerned about being able to get. And, and, and actually their concern was production more than uh, sourcing in those days. And if, if anybody is old enough to remember, I think at that time, the key metal of concern was dysprosium, the rare earth metal dysprosium. Okay, now it's 13 years later, and finally the bureaucracy in Washington codified the critical materials uh, in 2018 when the USGS Department of Energy, Defense, and Interior uh, listed 35 critical metals. Now, uh, in 2007, we weren't thinking about batteries. We weren't thinking about, uh, quite frankly, much about solar or wind. And we are now. I remember uh, I was part of that 2007 uh, creation of that list, and I remember being annoyed that tungsten was let off, uh, was kept off the list. Well, it's back, and now I'm annoyed that copper is kept off the list, and and we're talking about that in, in, in the U.S. government. But keep in mind that even though the administration changes, that only makes changes at the top. The United States has a permanent civil service just like Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa. We have people who spend their lives as bureaucrats, for example, in the Department of Energy or the U.S. Geological Service. Yes, the ultimate heads of those departments are appointed by the president and serve at his pleasure, i.e. the moment he's out of office, they're gone too. But 99% of all the people in these bureaucracies are permanent civil service. And this critical materials theme originated with them way back 13, 14 years ago, and they've been working on it ever since. And in fact, people think, oh, the president, you know, he he told them to do this. It's the other way around. They've been talking about this for a decade and a half. It finally penetrated to the highest levels of government. And it is not a partisan issue. It's not a Democrat or Republican issue in, in the U.S. It is policy. And the problem today is, how is that policy going to be enabled? Now, if you want to know the difference between the, the People's Republic of China and the United States of America, the answer is in the People's Republic, when the top dog, excuse me, the top man, uh, says we are going to have electric cars, then the bureaucrats in, the, uh, in China, they're, they're called mandarins, the permanent civil service in China make sure that happened. They don't think about it. They don't. Their job is not to think. China runs top down. America runs middle up. That's that's a big difference. So our bureaucracy, they spend their time convincing the management, the president, and and his cabinet of what they should do. Then it's then and only then does the top layer of our government react. And how do they react? They fund things. They they put out the money. I don't know how many times people, I've known people to be frustrated because the U.S. Department of Defense or, or Interior or Energy won't give them a grant. Well, be, because their budgets are fixed for the year. If they're going to give any money that isn't in the budget, it has to be approved very high up. Either the Secretary of Energy or the president himself, uh, of course, secretary is appointed by the president. So keep in mind that the drive to make the U.S. independent of China on crit- for critical materials, which is actually what the drive is, it's to be independent of China for critical materials, was came 
from the bureaucracy. It, they finally convinced the, the central go- the, the, the government to do it. Now they're trying to figure out how to, how to enable it. That's the problem. They look at the Chinese and they actually probably weep because the Chinese don't have the problem. The Chinese bureaucracy doesn't have the problem the American bureaucracy does. They are ordered to do things. Policy is set in Beijing. We're going to replace internal combustion engines with electric uh, propulsion in vehicles by a certain date. Let's, I don't know, 2030, 35, something like that. And they then tell the bureaucracy, get it done. Bureaucracy goes to state-owned companies and what's called a private company in China. And they say, did you want to have money for expansion? Yes. What are you planning to make? We're going to make Tootsie Rolls. No, 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 you're not. You're going to make components for electric cars or you don't get any money. Okay, we're going to make components for electric cars. That's how it works in China. In America, our bureaucracy says we really need to convert to alternate energy away from coal, have electric cars instead of internal combustion, and the car companies say, okay, so what? So what what do they do? The bureaucracy convinced the Congress to give subsidies for these various forms of energy production, and they did, and that kick-started an industry. Now, in the last few months, the, the, the dam's opened. General Motors and Ford, they, they said they're converting to electric propulsion in the next 10 years. By the end of this decade, they don't expect to make internal combustion-powered cars. Okay, that's a big change for them. Toyota was resisting all of this until very recently. Suddenly, they're very interested in it. All it means is that they've done the analysis, and they, they see that they're not going to have any friends in Washington unless unless they convert to this powertrain. Now, I've said this many times, and some people who know me know I say this all the time. The automotive companies would sell you hamsters on treadmills as power supplies if that's what you wanted. They just want to make money. They can't make money right now on electric cars. So the government makes all kinds of subsidies and grants to to help them out, so to speak. The, the big drive in the U.S. is to get the price of the batteries down because that's the killer. The battery is the most expensive component of an electric car. They're trying very hard to do this. If I were an investor, I would be looking at batteries, battery management, battery raw materials, and also the raw materials for solar and wind because these are these are big pushes by, by the U.S. government. Now, the U.S. government may look like a clown show to many, many of my friends overseas, but that's because it is. Okay, so it's not it's not a secret. However, uh, I do, let's say certain materials, as we all know, roll downhill. It's finally rolling. They're going to get this done. There is going to be a technology revolution in the sense of we're going to go away from internal combustion and we're going we're going to to electric operation not just of cars trucks forklifts golf carts bicycles believe me there's a lot and we can talk about lithium it's very important cobalt's very important don't rule out cobalt because even though the car companies don't want to use it cuz there really isn't enough our companies that make personal consumer products computers phones they have to use it because lithium cobalt is the highest power density battery known. So they want to give you a little tiny phone with as much power as possible. They're forced to use lithium cobalt, and they do. They'd be delighted. Apple would be thrilled if they could just get their car company to stop taking so much cobalt. They need it, okay? So cobalt's a good play. Lithium is, is the metal of the future. The rare earths are extremely important because guess what, folks? You can store energy with lithium, cobalt, nickel, and manganese, but you can't make anything move without rare earth permanent magnets. Those are those are the core of all electrically powered items. Okay, rare earths. And the the key rare earths are the magnet rare earths. Neodymium, praseodymium, dysprosium, terbium. It's a mantra, just keep saying it. And this is the future. Now, th- there'll always be a need for iron. There'll always be a need for aluminum. 
there's going to be more and more need for copper. Here's the little pro another problem the world has. There's lots of iron. There's lots of aluminum. But copper may be a problem. Um, I saw a prediction that copper would reach an all-time high price in the next 12 months. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Because even though a, a, a battery-powered car only uses 50 kilo of copper, guess what, folks? A brand new home in North America uses, on average, a quarter of a ton of copper. And that's permanent. That's not recycled until the house is torn down. So you think about that. You, you, every time we build a few million houses in North America, and that's a, that's a yearly event, we use a couple of million tons of copper. That's a healthy percentage of the copper. Copper is something to keep your eye on, and lithium, and the rare earths.